The upcoming release of Diablo 4 has me more excited than ever. It's been 11 years since the release of Diablo 3, and that was 12 years after the release of Diablo 2. Diablo 4 could mark a huge advancement in the path and trajectory of the whole genre of ARPGs to come. I'd like to chronicle the franchise, although briefly, enough to show you what this game is truly capable of doing. ARPGs are action role-playing games, but they have a specific style to them. They're isometric in nature and they combine elements from the typical RPG and action games alike. They also have a gameplay loop where once you beat the main story, you restart from the beginning and go around the world enhancing your character and building up to be as powerful as possible. Chances are, you have played an ARPG even if you didn't know that's what it's called. The first game of the Diablo franchise was initially being developed as a turn-based roguelike. However, in the last few months of development, they transformed it into what it is today. The real-time focus game still incorporates parts of the strategical gameplay and it meshed really well together. It wasn't as focused on character builds as much as the future games are. The game is very simple in terms of how you improve your character and with the items you find. This game has by far the darkest atmosphere of any game in this franchise. It had the replayability of future entries and a mod scene to improve upon it. There's not a lot more I'd like to say on this exact game, but if you have an opportunity, play it. It's highly underrated and often overlooked, but this game will give you a sense of how dark the world of Diablo actually is. Diablo 2 is one of my favorite games ever. This is a game that changed the trajectory of gaming. It expanded on what these types of games could truly be. The world was wide open and big, and while it featured a linear story, it didn't feature a linear world. You'd be given a quest and have to find the next step to take, while being susceptible to a battle at any point in time. It featured broader character customization than ever seen before, and started you off being able to choose from 5 character types, each of which that had 3 unique skill trees to choose from, and you can make your character fit your playstyle. The game featured a vast amount of item availability, and you find them in chests, enemy drops, and dungeons. Once you beat the game, run it back, and try to enhance your items and find the next best thing, and eventually you can create your ideal character. Since Diablo 2, games have run with all of these ideas and made them their own. Without Diablo, you probably wouldn't have a lot of the games we have now, or at least with some of the styles they hold. Diablo 2 not only paved the way for many games to come in terms of gameplay, the game's storytelling was a big part of the game's success. The story has an expanse of lore and picks up where the first game ended. I'm not going to spoil the story as I feel everyone should experience these games figuring it all out by themselves, but wow. The story opens with its beginning cutscene to set the stage, and then throughout the game you piece together more and more of the lore from books and talking to the people you encounter. It was a huge leap in terms of how much depth the storytelling a game could have at the time. Diablo 3 isn't held as highly as Diablo 2 in many regards. The anticipation of this game was astounding. Following up from one of the best games of all time, it was going to be hard for Blizzard to do it perfectly, and the failures were there from the start. The game had a record-breaking 6.3 million sales among launch, but these players were met with poor system performance and the necessity of the real-world auction house. Starting off, the developers made the world a lot brighter and used more colors to enhance the look of the game, to get past how the graphics of Diablo 2 were criticized for being so outdated, even for its time. This was an issue among players though, as playing through a game about going through hell and fighting monsters shouldn't look so vibrant. Error 37 swept the game's community and pissed off tons within it. This error left people confused and in the dark about not being able to play the game. It would stop you from playing and didn't give you any metrics on when you'd be able to. And this stemmed from having to always be online in order to play, regardless of the single player aspect. 
This would have been an understandable problem if Blizzard would have just given an ETA for when the servers were to be fixed. But the colossal size launch shocked them too and they weren't prepared to handle it. The game had another issue with its added on extra difficulty setting for players who replay the game over and over trying to max out their characters. These difficulty settings added increased challenge to make it more of a fulfilling experience to improve your enjoyment. They were there in Diablo 2, and in Diablo 3 they added the Inferno Mode difficulty. This was for maxed out players to play through and get items that exclusively drop within it. Sounds like a good thing, right? Wrong. This difficulty was so challenging that you would need a lot of the best gear in order to beat it. However, you only get the best gear from Acts 3 and 4 of Inferno Mode, so it's a revolving door of frustration. But that's where the issues with the auction house came in. It felt like you had to pay money to the auction house in order to obtain these items to make beating it actually a possibility. Thankfully, the developers made some tweaks to where you can find those high level items in every level of Inferno Mode, as well as Acts 3 and 4 of Hell Mode. Diablo 3 was a fumble upon launch. However, it showed resilience within the team at Blizzard as over the years and amidst the terrible working conditions highlighted through immense amounts of lawsuits and investigations, they pulled this game through the fire and flames and managed to make it survive for over 10 years now with a loyal player base. Not all is bad though because even now the game is extremely enjoyable to play as a casual player and the story sets Diablo 4 up amazingly. Pairing this with the absolute success of the Reaper of Souls DLC that added a firm foundation to the game for the years to come. This expansion added improvements to the loot grind, added the Crusader class, a new mode with more longevity, increased the player cap from level 60 to 70, and a new campaign act that was perfect. This game was a disaster as soon as it was announced. Everyone was expecting to receive news and or an announcement of Diablo 4, yet they were met with a mobile version of Diablo that nobody had been asking for. They announced it, received boos, and then asked the most poor timed, condescending rhetorical question I've ever heard. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that all have phones. The game is extremely pay to win. It's actually the most pay to win game I've ever seen. To reach the max level you can in the game, it would cost you $110,000. $110,000 to reach the max level. People pay tens of thousands of dollars in this game and it's astonishing. The game also has a battle pass which just feels completely out of place in a Diablo game. I can't lie, the game itself isn't that bad. It has everything a Diablo game normally would, but something feels off. It feels different than how a Diablo game should, like the passion behind the game is just missing. The game's monetization is super predatory and even incorporates a level wall that's so extreme that at a certain point it's not even worth trying to grind the game anymore. And that's where the microtransactions come in. You hit the level wall, you pay money for microtransactions and boom, you're back to playing the game. It's a never ending cycle. The microtransactions are so predatory in fact that a few countries wouldn't even let Diablo Immortal release in their regions. I'm not going to do justice to the explanation of how terribly greedy this game's design is, so I'd highly recommend watching a video that's purpose is to go in depth on these systems. It's baffling how much of a blunder Blizzard made in releasing this, knowing that the community was going to be almost entirely against it. Diablo 4 is entering its pre-purchase beta next weekend. A lot of content creators have already had access to playing it, and I've seen nothing but rave reviews on how well it's made. I want to be greeted by this game completely in the dark though, so other than the basic this game is amazing titles and such, I haven't looked too much into it. For the sake of gaming though, this game needs to be amazing. This franchise is extremely influential on the rest of the industry, and I hope that Blizzard has learned from the mistakes of Diablo 3 and Immortal and improve upon the foundation of the first three games in a way that does it justice. From the dungeons, the loot systems, the story, the bosses, and everything else within this game, it has the potential to change the trajectory of games as a whole for years to come. If you've never played a Diablo game before, I'd highly recommend you do so. The game's initial playthrough won't take you long unless you go back through and do all of the post-game content and take part in the full game. 
These games have been a huge part of my appreciation for different game systems, and I think everyone should experience the feeling you have when you get that final screen of, you beat Diablo. Thank you for watching.